it's not a bad drive, though, honestly. I mean, on that one, I would take the drive over the train just because you'll move a little bit faster, first of all, and then you have more control over the, the, yeah. the timing. And since the weather shouldn't be bad, it shouldn't be quite as bad. Your call. Yeah, we'll see. Or if you're late for the mountain. Mm -hmm. Not a drive. <laughs> so that would be where I would probably want to take the train. <laughs> yeah. Probably. He's being really enthusiastic in my answer, so I'll take the train. Yeah. Yeah, I was trying to remember what that was. Because there was a there was a coffee shop kind of wrapped through the corner of the building. I don't know what your setup is going to look like. What's the best placement for this? So, what would work for you guys? So, um, I mean, honestly, it's just for discussion kind of basic thing. So, right. I, I brought a couple of visual aids in case people aren't Cool. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. really, we can try We will see yeah. who shows up, um, and you can kind of include them in that conversation, too, depending on what their level of interaction is like. I don't know. You're going to flip back. You think you'll be standing in front of it? I mean, I can stand at it. 
It's up to you. And will you need any computer? No. Great. Okay. So we've got the handout, and basically any questions anyone has at any time. Great. Yeah. So it'll be kind of like just here. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Does it work? That that Simple. looks like it will work. Great. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, we can watch. Yeah. yeah. You guys are good to be recording. Is that okay? Uh, okay. I can share.
like, there's some skills that I need to work on. So I can work on that. Not learning any skills, not improving my skills. Learning a lot of things, reading a lot of things, but nothing about skills. So, okay, so that's a big That's a big question. Actually, I'm just coming in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm I think I so, so much. So, uh, I think you start off, right? I work for you. Yeah, yeah, you start uh, Some of that we don't want to teach in the spring, but that's why we put on so much before it happens. Fun. There's a hand over here tonight. Hi, friend. I don't know if I can. There we go. Okay. Hi. Thanks for being here. Have fun. We have any more time for us already? One, then you got my name. Got one. Got one. <laughs> there you go. I'm out of here. Okay, I see. Cool, that's awesome. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm just starting out. Let me take a seat. We're creating a great. Oh, that's a good idea. If you have questions or anything, um, I'll try and keep an eye on the chat. But you can also just unmute and say it because they want it to be more like a discussion conversation too. So if you have questions about it, um, I will also scan and post the handout in the mind at some point because they gave us a really good packet to use. Okay. 
Okay. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you for being here tonight. We have something really, 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 really exciting for you. Um, we've not done this before in recent years, I don't think. Have you all been here to do this? Um, not since 2016. Um, yeah, yeah, that was so the last time we did, but it was with a band building. Uh, but I, we, we thought this would be really cool. And I, from just reading and talking to them, it sounds like it's going to be really beneficial. Um, so we're going to talk about instrument repair tonight. We've got a ton of students in the shop. Um, so I'm going to introduce Curtis, um, who reached out to me and to BP to set this up, and they got a really great presentation. So let's welcome Curtis. And we Thank you, Katie. Um, like she said, my name is Curtis. I am an educational sales representative. Um, that role at the shop is one of many hats, but its focus is with the directors. So I spend five days a week traveling around to schools, seeing middle school, high school, beginning band teachers, orchestra teachers, um, choir directors, everything in the middle, general music teachers, because we do it all. We're like a one-stop shop. But the greatest part about my job is the, the people part. And I love interacting with um, students. I love interacting with teachers. I love interacting with their staff. We have fantastic people. You'll meet two here tonight for sure. Um, but I just wanted to first say hi and say thank you. I know we have some officers and we have some members of the NBA chapter, right? Awesome. So thank you all for being here. Um, thank you for um, allowing us to be here and allowing us. I forgot there's a, there's a Zoom thing going on. They're like, who's talking? So um, did everybody get one of the handouts that we brought? Awesome. If you didn't, let me know. I can, we have more over here. But I'd like to introduce a few people here, a few of my friends, co-workers tonight, um, two who are going to be talking specifically about what's in here. Um, so over here to your right, my left, um, we have in the far corner in the green shirt, Christopher Morris. He's the manager here at our Champagne location. Jonathan Breen, the um, company president of the music shop. And um, our two guest honored speakers tonight, um, uh, Nathan and Amy, they are full-time repair technicians. And that's what our topic is tonight. So how many of you have had your instrument repaired at any point in the history of playing your instrument? How many of you know how important a repair is to your instrument? How many of you know how important correct repair is to your instrument? How many of you have, and maybe it's not specific to here right now, have somebody in your life that is that person you say, I trust them with my life, with my instrument? Yeah, and if you don't, that's what, I mean, I don't see all the hands, and you don't have to say if it's us or not. But we, we pride ourselves on the amazing work we do. And, you know, we also pride ourselves on, on being honest and upfront about everything we do as well. And so you'll get not only the things of what this is, what not to do, what to do tonight, um, but also I'm sure some stories and some things that have scared us, you know, um, what we see in the store, but also um, some joy stories. And so we hope that, you know, this is an, an engaging experience. I know Nathan specifically said tonight he wants you to interact. Um, this is more of a table talk. Uh, we did this four years ago. Uh. Maybe more than that. <laughs> okay, yeah, a few years back here at one of our local public schools, Urbana. So some of those teachers will remember this. If you get a chance to observe them, they are fantastic educators. But I'm going to, without further ado, introduce Nathan Hauser and Amy Reed. So. <laughs> Hi. Um, as Curtis was saying, we developed this several years ago as part of an effort the uh, Urbana directors were doing a continuing education day. And we put together a little presentation that kind of smooths the difference between what gets done as an emergency in the classroom and when it gets to us, so that we're not mad and that the directors don't have to pay extra money. Um, but yeah, and if at any point you have a question or a comment or you, know, you have maybe an experience, uh, feel free to jump in and explain that. Um, but if you'd like to open it up, we can go ahead and get down to it. Uh, we start out with flute, which a lot of these will be, you'll notice, uh, common to a lot of different instruments. Uh, flute will be common with a lot of other padded woodwinds. Uh, the first one on the list is uh, what to do when you have a loose crown flute. Uh, lots of people get this, you know, suddenly it starts falling out of the top of the instrument or it won't stay in tune. Um, and we recommend Teflon tape. And Teflon tape is another thing you'll see a lot in here. Um, we really enjoy it as an invention. Uh, for anyone who's not familiar with it, it's also called plumber's tape, and it's this. It's 
just a strip of Teflon, uh, which doesn't stick to anything except itself, which makes it very useful and very easy to take off when your emergency repair is ready to be actually repaired. <laughs> so, yeah, other than that, we have the next one, a loose pad. Wrap it with Teflon tape if you can. Um, you can also, and we put this in here cautiously, uh, heat the back of the pad cup to melt the adhesive in it and kind of refloat it. Um, like I said, we do, uh, there is a note here, take great care uh, to avoid burning any cork or pad that's around in the area. And also make sure that it actually is glued in, especially on something like a flute. A lot of those pads are not actually glued into the instrument. In fact, in most, only the trill keys are. So, and the seat key. So yeah. Uh, for an, all right, we also have emergency pads. If, um, ah, hit here. So these are sold in kits. Uh, there's a couple of websites that sell them. We can also stock them and sell them. Uh, they're basically either foam or neoprene, and they're adhesive backed, like just stickers. So if you have one that's close to the right size of the temporary fix, you can pop out the old pad and just glue one of these in it temporarily. Uh, they're a great emergency measure. Um, they do sell flute ones as well that have the holes punched out in the middle of them already. But yeah, so in an emergency, those are, those are a fine fix, although you'll want to get it properly seated at some point as well. Uh, for an unhooked spring, uh, pretty easy. You can just, uh, if you see where it's supposed to be. Uh, you can gently push it back into the spring cradle, is what it's called. Um, when an instrument won't play, especially a flute, oftentimes you'll find it's just a spring came unhooked and suddenly a pad cup just isn't closing or opening correctly. Um, so it's always a good thing to look for as well. Um, missing springs. So this is where we get into a little bit of more technical stuff because you'll notice we said don't use rubber bands. And the reason for that is that rubber contains sulfur, which reacts with most plating and finishes, especially if it gets wet. So what seems like a good temporary fix, you know, rubber band, it'll hold something shut. All of a sudden, when you take it off, there's no plating underneath it, or it's turned completely black, or something like that. Um, so it's not intuitive, but it is there. Um, so if you can't rig something up, uh, don't attempt to replace it. And this is one of the things we see a lot is someone thinks it's just a piece of metal, right? So a paper clip will work. And then they destroy the post. <laughs> and suddenly, instead of needing a new spring, they need a new post. <laughs> so instead of $5, it's $150. So it can be, you know, a pretty expensive mistake to make. Um, Obvious regulation issues. Uh, so how, how many of you are woodwind players in general? Okay, a good bit. And how many of you know about regulation on woodwind instruments? Anyone else? Okay, so as a lot of woodwind instruments, a lot of the keys are interdependent on each other. You know, pressing down one key will press down multiple keys. Uh, pressing down one key while pressing another key will raise one. And so for obvious regulation issues where you know something is supposed to close together and something's staying open, um, there are often screws incorporated into the instrument that you can turn uh, to raise or lower pad cups. And that's great, but keep in mind, especially if you're an oboe player or something like that, that turning one screw often doesn't just change that one pad. And so suddenly another note will stop working and it's because the regulation is also dependent on something else. Um, so success is often limited when you try to do the regulations yourself if you're not really comfortable with how they all work. Um, yeah, if any resistance is present when you get a screw like that, don't try to force it because they are very small and very sensitive. And if it's frozen in there, it's best to get a technician to really work it loose over time rather than trying to force it and breaking, again, a piece of your instrument. Okay, uh, for sticky pads, um, we have a note here, and this is gonna change a little bit, and I think, Amy, you brought this up earlier. Uh, yeah, so uh, in here it says that you can use pad paper, non-glossy, because it's carbon paper. Um, 
pad paper, you want something that doesn't have powder on it because that's going to wind up adding more dirt and grime to the surface of the pad. It can, if it's wet, it can wind up creating kind of a paste, and you do not want that. That's going to make your pads wear out way quicker. So uh, you want something that doesn't have the powder. I think Yamaha makes it, may sell it. Uh, you can also find uh, ungummed cigarette paper. That works pretty well. Or um, you could use perm papers, which you can get at Sally Beauty. They're pretty inexpensive, and you get a lot of them in a box. So. Yep, and we do have a note on there not to use dollar bills. How many of you have had a teacher or someone tell you, yeah, don't, don't do that? <laughs> It works. It works in the moment, but I mean, uh, a lot of people have also heard the statistic of how many people have handled the dollar bill and its life in <laughs> circulation. So there's a lot of hand oil in it, and basically you're just rubbing oil onto the pad, which will make it slick for a minute, and then turn solid on you and stick even worse. <laughs> and it's also, you know, you don't want to rub a dirty dollar bill all over your pad. <laughs> Um, what was the one that was um, that you can find at Sally Beauty's? They're perm papers. Perm papers. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, as far as uh, for flutes, especially if the tenons are hard to put together or take apart, um, often just cleaning them with something that will evaporate quickly and not leave a residue, like alcoholic wipes or something like that will make that go better. If it keeps doing it, it means something's wrong. And what we see a lot is people putting grease on the tenons, which is not something you want to do on a flute. <laughs> so it really just gums it up, and then it's hiding a problem, and you're very likely to get it stuck. It, it also attracts dirt, which yeah. once you get dirt in there, it can cause what's called galling, which will scar up the tenon, uh, put really deep gouges in it, and that's those are Um, all right, and then we have on the, you know, don't try to attempt to repair this, uh, missing pieces, basically. Um, you know, a pivot screw or a hinge rod, they're a pretty integral part of the flute, and if you don't have the exact replacement part, anything else is likely to do more damage um, than good. So that's a thing, like, you know, if, unless you happen to have a pivot screw for an Emerson flute or something, they'll, they'll try to force something in that will work. Um, solder joints, do not super glue. You will see that a lot in this packet. <laughs> Never use super glue. <laughs> um, we don't like it. Uh, it's, it's very annoying to us when we come, when an instrument comes in covered in super glue. Um, but yeah, solder joints are, it's a very specialized skill. Um, so that's one of those ones that it might seem like a good idea to epoxy or solder a certain point, but we really recommend not doing that. Uh, snapped keys, uh, obviously that's a very difficult replacement. It's just a replaced part or brazing is what we call hard soldering or heat back together. Uh, spring replacements, again, as I said, uh, if you try to use something that's not sized correctly, you run the risk of really damaging the instrument. Uh, bent keys, these are also one of the really tempting repairs. You know, you see that it's just knocked a little to the side and you're like, well, I could just shove that over. but. If you go too far, if you make multiple attempts, or if it's just an older instrument, you run the risk of it just snapping. Uh, and then you're in the situation where you need an expensive replacement. Uh, dent work and lip plate damage, uh, especially on flutes. Um, they do tend to get dinged up. Um, and it's very rare that we see someone attempt their own dent repair. But we have seen it. <laughs> um, and it's not the same as auto body work, I will tell you that. <laughs> the tools do not translate. Um, so just best left to you know, someone who has all the specialized tools needed to do it. And the same with the damaged tenons. Okay. Uh, anything else on flute? Yes? I have a question. And this might also apply to other instruments, but um, rubbing alcohol, how is that for the finish of the flute? It's usually fine. Most flutes are either silver or nickel plated, and rubbing alcohol really won't touch that. Um, I mean, I wouldn't soak it. <laughs> but, like, that's, that's pretty important. Yeah, and, but as far as on the finish, it should just wipe off, evaporate, and not really do any damage. I've never had to To that end, regarding alcohol, would you prefer to go with wipes as opposed to like, having a bottle that you kind of use for this or like, wipe it down with? 
the bottle is fine. Um, I usually recommend op applying it to a cloth yeah. rather than you know directly to the instrument just because it's easier to control and you don't run the risk of soaking the pad. Yeah. You want to moisten the cloth, not soak it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just one of those things. Yes? Um, with all of these repairs, how expensive or like severe would you predict like total loads? Um, it depends. Uh, there's various levels of severity. Dent work is very subjective. And we, what we usually do is estimate based on how much time we think it's going to take to remove the dents. So like if you get a higher estimate, that means I'm probably going to be spending all day on this. You know? <laughs> so um, lip plate dents tend to be more expensive than body dents uh, because they are much harder to remove. And tenon dents can be expensive depending on their severity because it's very, very important to get them precisely round. Okay, uh, the next on the list. Before you move on, oh, to yeah. point on the alcohol wipes. The other reason why having rubbing alcohol on a bottle could be preferable is you can control the cloth that you use. Mm -hmm. So, you know, using a very fine microfiber cloth which doesn't have a hard grip to it, that could potentially scratch the finish of the instrument um, versus the alcohol wipes, which are going to be a much coarser paper uh, on that. Yeah. So, you know, as Amy said, you, you, you have to control the amount of alcohol that you put on the cloth. You just want to moisten it. So that's the nice thing about the alcohol wipes is at least they're kind of pre-moistened. Um, you know, if it were my instrument, I would use alcohol on a microfiber cloth as opposed to. Uh, yep. That's a that's a good point, especially silver-plated finishes. They scratch much easier than you think. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so as, moving on to clarinet, you'll see the first couple of things are pretty much the same. Uh, emergency pads and wrapping pads with Teflon tape if they're missing. Uh, unhooking strings, just fixing them if it's an obvious kind of thing. Uh, but then we get to the tenon corks, uh, which are a very common repair, torn or missing entirely tenon corks. Um, what we recommend, uh, you can wrap the trench, is what it's called, that little recess in the clarinet that the cork fits in. Uh, you can wrap that with blue painter's tape and put a little bit of cork grease on it. It's not gonna work great, but it might get you through a performance. Um, it will probably wobble still a good bit after you do that, but like I said, it'll, it'll at least seal enough for you to play through it for one performance. Um, yeah, they, there is an addition to the emergency uh, pads. I think there's some right here. Yeah, there's emergency cork which is the same thing. It's a strip of cork that's adhesive backed uh, that you can fit in there. Uh, again, it's not a permanent solution. Uh, unfortunately, some places have decided it is uh, that we've seen. Uh, I know I've seen things at a pawn shop that are labeled as like repadded, and it's all temporary pads and corks. <laughs> it's like it's, it's not, um, it will fail eventually, but it's very good. It, it works better than the painter's tape as an emergency fix. Okay, uh, never try to glue. Uh, we use, ourselves, we use a contact cement that's kind of formulated by an, a company that sells uh, repair supplies. Um, there are some other ones that work just as well. And, but if you don't have the correct type of glue, you could really do some permanent damage to your instrument. Um, again, no super glue, never, <laughs> never super glue. Um, for a loose tenon cork, like where the cork is spinning, or it's just kind of gotten torn off just enough for it to start peeling, you can wrap that in the Teflon tape, and that will usually hold it together. Yes? Can you just clarify tenon for some of our rascals? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, clarinet? Yeah. It's corks, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then also, can you explain what that looks like on a flute without Sure. So the tenons are the ends of each section of the instrument, and the cork right here basically creates a seal between the sections, so that no air passes between. Okay. Oh, yes, tenons right here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and on a flute, it's the same. It's a it's a smaller metal ring that goes at the end of the body of the flute and at the end of the head joint that fit into the next section. The, the tenons is right that goes into the other piece. 
Yeah. You know, they're, the piece that they spit into is usually called a socket. So. Okay. Um, so the same deal on sticky pads. No dollar bills, but there are other options. Just very clean, powder-free paper, essentially, uh, can help with that. Uh, adjustments for the clarinet. Uh, also, the, there is a very common adjustment screw on a clarinet. Uh, do a lot of you play clarinet? Anyone? Yeah. Um, so the A flat to A adjustment screw. You know, on the top joints, there's two little keys that kind of make a cross, and they are. Uh, it's very common for someone to tighten that screw down, and it just lifts the pad up. And that's always the first one I check if someone's like. I can't play below, you know, third finger, and I'm like, okay, um, it's this. <laughs> so that's a that's a good one to watch out for. That most directors or someone with experience can really catch right away. Um, e B won't play. The crow's foot adjustment. Um, so yeah, I can pull yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. So e B for those of you that might not know <laughs> is the well, he's the lowest note. Is same fingering but with the registered key, so all, all your fingers down for those of you that don't play clarinet. Right. And the crow's foot on a clarinet is this piece here, which kind of extends from this top key down in between these two and makes a little foot so that whether you press here, here, or here, it's always depressing this key. Um, and the crow's foot gets bent very easily because it's a thin piece of metal that just goes down in between there. Um, so checking that and making sure both keys are hitting it and closing correctly uh, is a good start if that is their problem. And building up a few layers of Teflon tape on the crow's foot can sometimes get you where you need to be on the adjustment. Let's see if we need this again. <laughs> Okay. Stub swab. Uh, so the tendency for stub swabs, which gets people in trouble, is, oh, it got tight. I better pull harder. And that's, <laughs> that's not a good idea, uh, because it usually means it's snagged on something. Or there's a knot in the swab that is not big enough to pass through the, the bore of the instrument. Um, so it's. As soon as it starts tightening up, if you can push it back out, or if there's enough left out of the instrument to pull it back, that's your best bet. Um, there have been some clarinets and mostly oboes <laughs> that have been so stuck I couldn't believe it. So it's like where you, where you're almost at the point of disassembling the instrument to try to get the swap out. Um, so should you use a flute, a flute tuning rod to jam that back through? You should not do that at all. <laughs> uh, you can't get it out. You might as well just send it into the shop and get it out for you. Another question over there. Yes? There's some discourse within the clarinet community as if you should swap bell to barrel or barrel to bell. What is your take? I generally do barrel to bell because if it doesn't stick right away, it's not going to. Right. <laughs> I've never heard of anybody doing the opposite way. Why is it so? Long? I have. Some people have believed, like, believe that if you go from bigger to smaller, it somehow helps. But it, it makes cleans. It the the, the, yeah, yeah, the theory is that it like, cleans better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's also like the registered chimney. Like, <laughs> that's the same. Yeah. Hurry, then I'll be barrel bell. Yeah, but. Yeah, it. Yeah, it is something that especially oboe players tend to say, yeah, uh, like, oh, if you go the other way, it cleans it better. But that's not really accurate, and you are much more likely to get your swab stuck that way. So, Are there swabs you would recommend versus not when it comes to cleaning um, and general maintenance? Um, for clarinets, uh, the it gets stuck much less often. It's a lighter bore, and it's a less of a ta severe taper than an oboe. And it doesn't have a giant water tube sticking through it. It has a smaller water tube. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but so for clarinet, it's not as essential to get like a really thin fabric. Uh, for oboe, most people get like a silk. Yeah, I like silk swabs for everything. Yeah. Besides flute, but that's a different thing. But yeah. That's, that's a preference. Silk swabs are fine. Yeah, silk swabs tend to get stuck less. They're thinner fabric. They're slipperier, so they get they move through the instrument easier. Fine. 
Okay. Uh, the bridge of key adjustment. Um, this one's a little iffy. Um, so basically, the bridge key is the key that links the top and bottom joint of the clarinet. And it gets bent very easily, especially if it's kind of overhanging in the case or something like that. Um, it's, it can be tricky to adjust. You can try wrapping Teflon to add thickness to one side of it. Um, but it's very likely that if it's bent, it's in a way that's not going to be easy to fix uh, right away. So <laughs> we, de we generally recommend, you know, if there's a problem with your bridge adjustment, just run it in. <laughs> Okay, uh, the never attempt to repair, some of the same ones as flute, missing pivot screws or hinge rods, uh, snapped keys, replacement springs, bent keys, uh, loose socket rings. This is a tricky one. We've actually had a problem with this recently um, <laughs> with, because the weather has been fairly dry. It's getting wetter now. Um, but especially when the weather turns dry, um, you'll notice on clarinets especially, the rings, the little metal rings at the ends get really loose and start spinning and falling off. And that's because the wood is drying out. Um, so it's really important not to uh, try to put them together while that's happening, because you might crack them. Um, yes? I was at Edison back in January, and the clarinet, one of the clarinet players, six grades, her thumb key just literally fell off, screwing everything. Like, we looked on the ground, we could not find the screw. <laughs> that was my biggest concern. But, this, like, is that because the weather? That would probably be because the screw was backing out slowly over time. And just they pressed it down, and that was just enough turn to slide it out. Uh, that's usually how that happens. <laughs> if you don't notice that it's getting loose, then it can just, yeah. So how often should middle, high school, whatever, clarinet players maintenance their screws or whatever? Uh, that's a tricky question. They shouldn't really <laughs> have to do it ever. Yeah. Usually, it should really be backing out. Sometimes if they, you have an older instrument, uh, the threads will get worn on those screws. Sometimes that can happen. Yeah. yeah. Basically, the warning sign is. No, we can, we can fix that. <laughs> yeah, we can fix that sort of thing. Uh, yeah. But it's 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 one of those things. Yeah, you really won't know it's a problem until it happens a couple of times, and then you're like, okay, we need to keep an eye on these screws, or we need to take it in so they can get them tightened up. Re-threaded. Yeah. Re-threaded in severe cases, or just kind of gummed up in a lot of cases. <laughs> the, the real answer to that question is never. You know, it, when, a, yeah. when a junior high or high school kid should be turning screws on their instrument, you really don't want that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not so, a, you know, if they're finding screws backing themselves out consistently, and clarinet thumb rest screws will do that. Um, you know, there are lots of issues there in terms of the screws could be stripping out the holes. Yep. Um, you know, the trick with that is that, that it, it's very tempting to either get bigger screws, which, you know, you run the risk of potentially running through the bore, you know, through the wall of the clarinet into the bore, um, or just egging out those holes even more. So, you know, better to bring it in because there are techniques that will be used, you know, those holes can be filled with thin drill plates. Yeah. And you can really, you know, you can you can reset the screws in a different way. Yep. So again, you know, Nathan and Emil know how to deal with that. It's not an expensive repair, it's not a difficult repair, but it can be made much more expensive, much more difficult yeah. if somebody tries to do it themselves and then it, it creates additional damage. I have actually known, this is an old school kind of repair tech mindset. I have known repair techs that will throw away any screwdrivers they find in a case that comes into them for repair. We have one. It's not as common I've noticed among the, the younger repair techs now, but I definitely worked under a few of those who were like, Get this out of here. <laughs> it was for registered. Yeah. It's, it's the same problem, though. It's going to be if, if a key falls off and there's not like a post missing or something, then the it's usually because the screw backed out. Okay. Um, but yeah, the loose socket rings, like I said, that means your wood is dry. Um, the correct solution is to hydrate it, but that can be a little tricky. Uh, we do sell uh, humidifiers that you can put in your case. Um, there's a lot of them on the market, and that's kind of the best way to keep the wood treated correctly. Um, if they do fall off, though, like I said, don't try to put it together because you're, you're running the risk. The rings are there to prevent the pressure from when you put it together from cracking the wood. Uh, so if you try to do it without those rings, you're really upping the chance that that will happen, and that is an expensive repair to fix and crack. Um, the opposite of that, stuck joints. 
usually happens. There, there are cases where it's because grit got in there or something like that, but it usually happens because the wood absorbed enough moisture while it's together to swell and then it's stuck. And you can very easily snap your tenon off or something like that if you try to force it. Um, yeah, lots of bent keys, you see from that as well. Uh, damaged tenons, uh, chips out of the wood or plastic in the tenons, um, that's not something that we recommend people try to fix. Uh, there are fixes for it, building stuff back up and then sanding it smooth and that kind of thing. And there's the stuck swabs again. Uh, don't continue to fold. <laughs> yeah, that is the advice there. Okay, uh, anything else on clarinets? Yeah. Bore oil. Bore oil. Does it work? It, it does work on wood instruments. Bore oil is uh, treating the wood will vastly increase the life of the instrument. It, it will help hydrate the wood again too. I like to uh, oil things that are very dry. I try not to do it as much just because some people say it bends the sound of the instrument. Uh, that's kind of up yeah. to debate, but yeah, it, it does help. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, treating the wood. Like I said, um, and this is actually where repair kind of falls. It, it overlaps with several other professions. Uh, woodworking being one of the big ones. Uh, woodworking, jewelry making, and plumbing are the three that are most commonly used. And we also have a lot of similarities to, auto, similarities to auto repair, although that's more conceptually than physically. <laughs> um, but yeah, so in woodworking, you know, lots of woodworkers will show you like the different finishes you can use for wood, the different oils you can use to treat wood. And yeah, bore oil is basically that. It's treating the wood, prolonging the life, maintaining its integrity. Don't, don't try to oil your board yourself, though, because you will ruin your hands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does drip out the end. Yeah, you have, to, you have to disassemble the instrument completely. Yeah. So is, is like getting a, a brass instrument back a precision issue? Uh, for woodwind instruments, as far as the bath, um, submerging. No, like, bore, like you have to take off oh. the pads if you're going to do that. But yeah. Like, like bore oil, you're just Oh, boral, yeah. It's it's the same, yeah, because in brass instruments, if you don't clean them often enough, you build up corrosion, uh, you start losing copper and zinc out of the instrument, and so cleaning it regularly prolongs the life. And the wood is kind of doing that. It's the treatment for wood like you would treat the metal by cleaning it often. Yeah. Um, there, I mean, any natural oil will technically work, but they will smell because they're oil. Uh, like, I've seen people use olive oil, but then you smell like brands with olive oil. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there are blends uh, which have additives in them to kind of keep them fresher and uh, less like that. Um, usually it's not tasted oil. Usually it's, yeah, almond is very popular. Uh, almond oil, and they add... Yeah, they, they add like a little bit of citrus oil, which is supposed to keep it from going rancid. That's, it smells very nice. <laughs> yeah, so. The key there, though, I think, is the takeaway is the idea that you want a technician to do that. Yeah. So that you don't get excess oil on the pads or yeah. places where you don't want any oil. Because it is super hard to control it um, when you're doing it, and super hard to remove. Side of the instrument, you run the risk of getting bad on the pads and getting fingers on the outside. So, yeah, just best to you know, let the tech get in there. Yeah, yeah, oiling is a, is a difficult one, but yeah, it's I, I do recommend the instrument seeing oil at least a couple times a week. <laughs> yeah, okay, uh, anything else, clarinets? Um, okay, uh, so for saxophone, uh, we've covered like the, an increasing amount of the same things. Uh, there's a little bit uh, difference in the pads. Uh, if most of you have seen saxophones, they tend to use leather pads instead of uh, skin pads, like most of the smaller woodwinds do. Um, so heating the back of the pad cup, they're a little more forgiving, but you still want to really, really be careful. It's best if you don't do it at all, honestly, <laughs> but that's the emergency if you need to float something around a little bit. Um, replacing with an emergency pad. There are emergency sax pads. They're kind of expensive <laughs> and for emergency pads uh, because they're so large. Um, but yeah, and 
Unhooked springs, the same thing. If it's obvious where the spring is supposed to go, go ahead and just gently push it back to where it's supposed to be. Uh, missing neck ports. Uh, this is pretty specific to saxophones um, because they have such an exposed neck port out on the edge of the neck. Uh, they get damaged very often. Um, so wrapping the blue painter's tape like you would with the tenon can work. Uh, wrapping with Valentino emergency cork, again, they sell one. Uh, the sticky back emergency cork. Uh, but again, try not to use any glue, any adhesive, uh, other than what's on the temporary stuff. Because um, again, it's, you know, if you use super glue, that's bad and you're going to get charged extra for that. <laughs> okay. um, loose neck corks, wrapping with the Teflon tape like you would a tenon cork. Uh, sticky pads, the same thing. Uh, this is the one that's most commonly, their teacher told them to rub a dollar bill on it. Uh, that's, that's a, I don't know why it was all the saxophone players that were taught this. <laughs> but, but it seems to always be saxophone players that are like, oh, my teacher told me to put a dollar on it. Well, <laughs> unless you got that from the bank in a series of serialized bills, <laughs> you know, then, then you shouldn't use it. Okay. Uh, missing key guard screws. That's a pretty big one with saxophones. The key guard screws just from the vibration of the instrument over time, will often fall out. And we recommend, yeah, pipe cleaners or twist ties. Um, this is another one where we see paper clips used a lot, or like little bits of wire hanger, just kind of twisted in there to hold it on. And that works, but it does destroy any threads that are there, is the problem. So they have to be re-threaded, which is an additional kind of repair. Um, so we do have the twist ties in here. So, yeah, just these are just like you know garbage bag twist ties. They're plastic coated so that the wire won't be in direct contact with the metal, because um, that's what will rub and and destroy the threads. Okay. Um, yeah. Again, uh, putting the neck in and out of the saxophone is another. It's like the flute tenons, uh, where you don't want to really grease it. You just want to try to clean it, and if that doesn't solve it, then it's a it's a bigger issue. Okay. Uh, when the saxophone is only playing high, the octaves are very often what is bent on a saxophone because kids put the neck on, and if you're familiar with the saxophone, the octave key wraps around the neck, and so they grab the neck and squeeze it, and then wriggle it on, and just bend the key in a dozen different directions, and so then it doesn't play, and you're like, oh, okay. Um, so that is a very common repair. Uh, that is. Pretty easy to you get to just check it, um, but if it's pretty bent, then you should take it to a technician definitely. Um, <laughs> don't just bend it back. Uh, no, so many teachers do, right? Yeah, yeah. So many teachers do, and then they're like, now it's not playing in a different way. Yeah. <laughs> it's because your octave is now opening the secondary octave instead of the first <laughs> because you bent it too far. Yeah. <laughs> yes. playing at rest without you having to pull on a key, yeah, then it's probably bent. <laughs> so, yeah. That's some interesting advice. Can you find out who the person was? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, before I became a tech, I'm, I'm a trumpet player myself. And before I became a tech, when I was playing in high school and college, I was never told that my instrument needed to be repaired ever. So I just gave it home baths and Eventually, all my valves were sticking, and yeah, I had teachers that never told me, well, you should take it somewhere and get it professionally cleaned. So I ended up, now I'm a repair tech. <laughs> my dad is a woodwind repair tech. He did not know about brass and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but so I, I did develop one of those techniques of pulling up the valves on every rest 
we were trying to get it to go. But yeah. Um, yeah, anything else on saxophone? The end plug is actually serves one very important purpose, which is to keep part of the octave mechanism from bending. Um, because by design, it sticks out past the end of the saxophone. So if that's in the case, without that end plug there to support the back of it, it'll get bent back um, and cause octave problems again. That also helps with uh, case fit. Uh, yep. So usually the saxophone case will have a little bit of extra space to accommodate that end cap. So if you don't have that, it's going to shift to the case a little bit. And that, if, you're, if you don't have a well-fitting case, that can also cause other you know, potential damage. Okay, uh, for the never attempt to repair on saxophone, we've got a lot of the same, you know, missing parts, don't try to do, don't super glue solder joints, uh, snap keys, spring replacements, vent keys, dents. The difference on saxophone is that the bell, oftentimes, because it's braced usually in only one or two spots, often gets shifted out of alignment. Um, it happens if it's just shut in the case, like we see it as simple as the kid put music in their case and shut the case. And that can be enough to knock it out. Um, <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's one of those things. It's, we really, it's a difficult thing to do because, like, you know, we'll repair a saxophone. It will go in the case. The kid will immediately close a book on it. And then they're like, my saxophone wasn't fixed. And they're like, um, it was. <laughs> Wait, <the keys. laughs> I'm sorry. Are you talking about the, the keys on the bell? Not just the keys, the bell itself. Um, if you look at it in relationship to the body, it should be pretty straight, and often it will actually get shoved to one side or the other, which will cause the bell keys to hit either in the front or the back, instead of lying flat. Um, so that is, like I said, it's a very common thing that we see. Um, it's pretty easy to fix, usually. That, there are exceptions to that. <laughs> um, and a lot of saxophones are also, if you look at them closely, some of them will actually have a ring connecting the bell to the body with screws. And that's usually because they're only attached with like silicone or something like that. Usually Sometimes, yeah, epoxy yeah. or silicone or yeah. something, like something that forms a gasket. And if it gets shifted badly enough, that actually cracks. And then it's much easier for it to move. And it might not actually be sealing either. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and the body as well, because it's such a long tube, can often get bent in any direction uh, from a drop, usually, or uh, and that is another thing that you know if if you're good enough to see it, but you don't know how to fix it, don't try because you can make it a lot worse real fast. Yes. I have a, a kind of a general woodwind repair question. Yeah. So how many of the repairs that you see are from once a year? <laughs> <laughs> how many a times lot. a year? A lot. <laughs> They get dropped all the time. Um, more interesting is when they get hit by the flags. That is actually a pretty common thing we see. Tell them not to do pastures. It's pretty much no more. Well, I can get to U of I specific repairs in a minute because we're coming up on the brass. I am, I am the brass repair technician at the store. <laughs> So I see all the repairs that come in every year after year after year. <laughs> yeah, usually we have to do a lot of saxophone bell alignments. Yeah. <laughs> the marching band here has a very energetic show, which is awesome. Yeah. Except for the repairs. No, we like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, you know. So you've gotten a U of I saxophone where you had the, the bell was not aligned. Oh, yeah. It's usually oh, pretty sunny, though. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's not like with the, the middle school where it's like... Yeah, yeah, like, it's usually... I've seen the keys hitting in back before. Yeah, it's one of those things. If you see the keys hitting in back, there it can be bent keys. It can sometimes be a regulation issue, but that's usually not it. <laughs> um, yeah, usually and, I can tell if, if, uh, if I push down just the key by itself, if it hits all the way around, then it's usually not a bell line issue. Right. But if it hits first in the front and back, then usually, then usually the bell is a little off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay.
so moving on to the brass side of things, trumpet, uh, the first thing is stuck mouthpieces. And this is pretty universal across the board on brass instruments. Uh, how many brass players do we have? Okay. We're in the minority. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got one online. Okay, excellent. Oh, <laughs> Um, but stuck mouthpieces, uh, you know, the most common thing is, you know, oh, my mouthpiece is stuck. I gotta twist harder. I gotta twist harder. Uh -oh. I gotta twist harder. Snap! Uh oh. <laughs> it's like, pipe. Yeah, the lead pipe just came off. Uh, so we recommend as soon as it's stuck, if it doesn't come off with just medium pressure, uh, go to the mouthpiece puller. And this is one of the tools that, as long as I know they know how to use it, I'm pretty much fine with directors using. Yeah. Um, we do this free of charge, so it's and that is to encourage people to bring it in before they break their lead pipe. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so if, if the mouthpiece is stuck, you can always tell someone, hey, just take it to the music shop to pull it for free. They might give you an estimate on your instrument, and that'll be the price. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but the mouthpiece pull is always free. And I would, I would just add that I'm surprised how many teachers might not have experience with one of those, and so... You know, um, if you want them, maybe before you get into the field or you get your first job, make sure that, you know, job has something like that and, and, and ask the local store, hey, can they buy one of those? They're somewhere about 50 to $60, yeah. and it's probably one of the best investments, especially if you have, you're teaching young kids, yeah. and they get some drop. Um, and, then, and then ask, you know, ask the service rep that comes to your school. We all know how to do it. I can teach you, you know, come into the store. If you have a local store, ask them. You know, so if you build that skill yourself, you'll become more valuable to that program. So. Yeah. yeah, and it's like I said, it's a very easy thing to, to demonstrate, and like I said, we do it for free. And if you ask, can I see how you do it? Yeah, and I'll, I'll point it out, and I'll show you how everything fits. This is the simplest one, I will say. If you go online, you will find a lot of other ones. Um, there are basically three different types. I wouldn't recommend the other two for directors, because they can get pretty complicated pretty fast. I have um, the bobcat one that you have, and then I have the gold one that doesn't have the locking thing at the bottom. Yeah. I don't understand how, like, you guys just I just use the bobcat one. Does it, did it come yeah, with so a bunch of little metal rings? You can tie that screen, you can see how it works. Because I think that's probably the collet puller, <laughs> which is, uh, it comes with like a dozen different collets that you have to kind of size for the shank of the mouthpiece. But like I said, they get complicated. <laughs> I don't think you use for me. I mean, I bought it years ago. It shouldn't be because of where you place it. Uh, it actually goes on the lip of the receiver, so there should be no motion when you're tightening it. Uh, if it's slipping, it means it's not on correctly, and you should stop, basically. Yeah. So uh, it's like you put it on the on the very bottom of the shank. Yeah. On the mouth, on the mouth. Like so where the shank, where the shank goes into the instrument. It's the puller mostly just touches the mouthpiece. Oh, yeah. Is it dry erase? I don't want to use a permanent marker on your board. No. <laughs> I have a trumpet. You want to my oh, if you, you have, have a trumpet, you have a trumpet. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. If you've got a trumpet, that's better. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Oh, oh. oh. So, so I can throw it on my too. Um, so on the trumpet, this piece right here that's soldered on to the end of this, the lead pipe, this is the receiver. Um, and the mouthpiece fits in here, and often, especially for little kids, they sit here doing this, and that's what makes it stuck. Um, but the mouthpiece puller, the little bottom parts, fit only on the top bit of this receiver, um, and push down on that while pulling up on the mouthpiece with straight line force. Um, that's what pops it out, and that's why it doesn't twist. And like I said, if the bottom parts start, if you feel them start to slip down at all, um, then you need to reset. Do you want to show them? Like, you no, can hold on one end, or do you want to? I mean, I can attach it. Yeah, yeah just at least the one inch and cut it. 
So yeah, so just loosening a little. Because no. <laughs> there's one being passed around too, so they kind of. Okay. So, yeah. And when the mouth gets it work, the tool doesn't work. Send it in. Send it in. Yeah, yeah, I'll pick it up even if it can't fit in the case. So, yeah. like I said, these two metal pieces, if you can see, should fit. Never use that. That extremely snug, out. and then you tighten down the nuts. Not normally. So they're and then, resting on the edge. <laughs> yeah. And then you just tighten and tighten and tighten this as it raises the plate until it meets the bottom of the cup, and it'll just pop it. You want to make sure you tighten both sides evenly, right? Yep. If you see one side getting lopsided, then twist the other side. <laughs> yeah, you want you want as straight a force on it as possible, essentially. Thank you for letting me jump in. Oh, that's fine. Uh, like I said, we're getting said brasses. Brass instruments are very similar to each other, so we don't have to go over absolutely everything. Um, broken solders. This is universal brass instruments. Uh, we recommend zip ties. Again, this is a way to uh, avoid super glue. Uh, some people call them cable ties because they're used in computers a lot. Uh, but this is just a very simple way to, you know, just around the solder joint and tighten it up. And it's real easy for us to just cut it off and redo the solder for you. That whole container is zip tied? Yep. Yeah. Well, and the zip ties that I stuck in there. But yeah, this is, uh, I think this cost three bucks at Menards. So, that's you know. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, missing water key corks. Uh, a little bit of Teflon tape over the open hole of where the water key cork should be covering is about the best solution. Uh, there are also emergency corks, like there are emergency pads uh, for that kind of thing. Um, if air is not traveling through your trumpet, and this is also if it's not traveling through your baritone, if it's not traveling through any pistoned instrument, check the alignment of the position of the pistons. Most of them will be labeled, you know, one, two, three, four. And it's very often for, especially during oiling, one of them to get reversed. And at that point, your air is obstructed um, and it won't play correctly. Uh, so that's like the easiest thing to check for. Um, also, the piston getting turned backwards. Um, and that's a little trickier because most trumpets print it so that the number should face, face back towards the receiver. But certain companies like King and Besson will put it at an angle or towards the bell. So. But it is one of those things you can at least see if they're consistent uh, across the board. Okay, uh, stuck slides. Uh, if it doesn't come out with just a little bit of flexing, leave it alone, um, basically. <laughs> uh, stuck pistons, re-oil and attempt to remove them by hand. Never use a tool to try to get a stuck piston out because the pistons are hollow and very easy to puncture or bend. So. Uh, water key spring broken, uh, that's another use of the twist tie or some sort of plastic wrap wire. Uh, just never a rubber band, basically. Could you there. use the Teflon stuff? You could use the Teflon tape, yeah. Okay, uh, never attempt to repair. Uh, we never recommend doing your own dent work. Uh, broken solder, stuck mouthpiece. Never, basically just stay away from pliers on mouthpieces. <laughs> is my advice there. I've seen many a mouthpiece ruined by a pair of pliers. Yeah. So. What about valves that are stuck? Oh, like you said, if you can't get them out with just your hands, don't try, is essentially where that goes. Because like I said, pistons are very delicate, very precisely machined, and hollow. So it's just not worth the risk to try anything other than by hand. What if they, like, you can get them out, but they don't go deep? But they don't go back in? Yeah, like, I had a tuba that I was a student at Edison. And I could get the valve unscrewed and out and oil it, but then, like, for whatever reason, putting it back in was very, like... Uh, there is a certain situation where I have seen that happen. Um, what it usually is, is even a little bit of light contact if there's a bearing surface that's not the same as the top of the casing, like if there's a little part down in the casing that sticks out further. If you make contact with that, even very lightly, you can form a lip of metal, and 
because the pistons are machined to within like two thousandths of an inch, even a lip you can't see with your eye is enough sometimes to prevent it from working correctly. Um, and in that case, it's a repair that I do with sized mandrels. So, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's tricky. Like a lip? Like, yeah. Um, so like the first dog on a tube like, doesn't go back into the cage. Yeah. So if you took it out to oil it, yeah. and then you were putting it back in, but oftentimes there's uh, the, the casing itself, and then soldered inside that casing is what's called the bearing surface, okay. which is where the, the piston actually works against. So the inside of the cylinder. Mm -hmm. And so if that is soldered in there and not integrated as part of it, because Yamahas are usually the entire length of it is the bearing surface, so it doesn't happen as much on them. Um, but other other ones solder the bearing surface in like an inch or so below the top part of the casing, um, and so there's a there's already a lip of metal there that is the correct size. You're talking about okay, so it's the top of the valve casing is what was making it hard to go into. Yeah, if that okay. if it gets impacted, it can it can prevent it from going in well. Yeah. Okay, got it. Okay, uh, trombones, much of the same stuff. Um, the only difference is you have the giant hand slide. Oh, uh, yes, sorry, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so let's say hypothetically that was bleeding, bleeding their horn with a snake and yep. it got stuck in the groove. In the bow. Yeah. Uh, is there a way that someone could get that out? <laughs> I did. 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 Do you have it? Yet? Oh, well, I mean, that's no. usually the preferred way. Uh, the snake is, you know, just the coil in there with the bristle brush. <laughs> yeah, no, I got the brush. It's like a little non-coil. Like yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's usually, I mean, they usually sell that with the trumpet. It's, like, yeah, it's, it's their preferred it's way. Pretty standard. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, I can definitely extract those, but it is not something that is easily done a lot of times. <laughs> uh oh. Cool. You might be seeing one. <laughs> That's why. Um, yeah, I actually always take bets when something's stuck where you can't see it. I always take bets with the rest of the technicians on what I'm going to find in the trumpet. Okay, so it's not in the curve, but it's just far away enough that, that you can't grab it. Yeah. yeah. So this is no longer hypothetical. <laughs> oh, it never was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, like I said it's it is something that I I do quite often, but it's. It's often not something that could be done easily without a lot of tools. <laughs> so, okay. um, so trombones, uh, like I said, much of the same stuff, except you have the giant hand slide, which you don't have on a trumpet usually. Uh, if it gets stuck, if you can't remove it by hand, the problem is people, it's a giant lever. Um, so it's very easy to twist or break all the braces on a trombone using the slide as a lever. Um, and that's where people get into trouble a lot. And that also, there's a similar repair to it from the um, mouthpiece puller, but it's specialized tools because the gap is so small. So that's something that I really recommend you bring immediately uh, before something happens to it so I can get it loose for you. Um, stuck slide locks. Um, if you, anything that's threaded that gets stuck is kind of iffy to repair yourself, but on a slide lock particularly, sometimes just tapping it very lightly around with like a very small hammer uh, is enough to break up if it's just stuck due to gunk in there and, and let it turn freely again. Um, so like I said, that's, it's iffy to tell someone, hey, hit your instrument with a hammer, because if you don't know <laughs> what you're doing with that hammer, it's not a good idea. <laughs> okay. Um, Bent water keys, uh, very similar. The water keys on trombones tend to be very long and easily bent. Um, so bending them back can work, but if it's past like just a really slight bend, you're very likely to snap if you if you try to do it. Um, yeah, and missing water key ports, the same as everything else. Uh, the never try to repair um, slide issues, but, but beyond just swabbing it out like a like a normal cleaning. Uh, like the slides are machined to very close tolerances like trumpet pistons. So even very minor things like dents that are very hard to see can be affecting it. 
So I recommend you know bringing that in where I have all the tools to, <laughs> to get it correct again. Um, second mouthpiece, never use pliers, broken solders, don't use super glue. Again, on there, don't use super glue. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, uh, so if anyone has anything else on trombone, or uh, we could just hit, like I said, French horn should be about the last thing I have on here. Um, French horn is very similar, stuck mouthpieces. Mouthpiece pullers are the way to go, never pliers. Uh, broken solders, always use zip ties instead of super glue. Uh, stuck slides are the same. Uh, if you can't get it out, just wiggling it with your hand gently, then it probably needs to be pulled uh, by a technician. Um, if you have loud rotors, uh, this is something that's especially on beginning players. Uh, they don't know where to oil their rotors. Um, so always oil the points and then check for loose screws around the rotor um, if it's like a rattling noise. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's still often just they haven't been told. You know, like there's bearing oil that goes at the top and bottom of the rotor and there's surface oil that goes on the surface of the rotor. Um, and if they just haven't been taught that, then it dries up and gets loud or sticks. So it's one of those things that just to watch out for. Um, a stuck rotor, um, if you can't, if you can try oiling it and waiting for the oil to penetrate down and then attempt to make it work again. But if it doesn't do that, it probably needs to be cleaned or there's something bent. Okay. Uh, loose or broken rotor string. Um, there are instructions. Uh, available to tie a rotor string. It's a bit complicated, and I am happy to show people how to do it if they come in and ask. Um, but it's a little complicated to explain. Um, like if you've ever seen a rotor, you know, it kind of comes out of the arm, wraps around the rotor, goes back through the arm, and comes back down the instrument. Um, so it's, it's basically like learning to tie a knot. You just have to practice it over and over and over again until you know what you're doing. <laughs> Do you have the instructions you've given me to give to educators somewhere? Um, I mean, in the email that I sent you. Is it still, okay. it still be there? Okay. I would, was that something I could send to Katie and she could send to them if they want? Yeah. Is that I mean, one? that's a general that's a general repair thing. Yeah. Okay. I'll see if I can get it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll see if I can get it. Yeah. Okay. Um, like I said, the same things, the never attempt to repair, dense, uh, damaged rotors, broken solders, stuck mouthpiece, if you just don't use pliers on them. Um, bent levers is also a thing that happens quite often on French horns, and I don't recommend attempting to repair them because you can really affect the level of the rotors. Um, and so if you don't know exactly where the angle is supposed to be, it can be bad. Um, case repair is the last thing I have on here, which is we often see a lot of case repairs. Uh, linings fall out. Uh, the styrofoam gets loose, and for that, hot melt glue is usually the preferred. It's usually what they use to build the case. Uh, hot melt glue, like a glue gun. Okay. Um, yeah, it's it's basically it's usually what they've used to make the case, and that's because uh, at some adhesives we act badly with styrofoam, uh, especially cyanoacrylate or super glues. Um, they can actually melt or, in some cases, combust foam. <laughs> Um, so, I've gotten them to smoke. I haven't gotten it on fire yet. <laughs> but yeah, um, so that's why we recommend the hot melt because it's basically just a very, you know, you melt it, it gets sticky and it doesn't react with anything badly. Um, yeah, all other interior issues are usually a sign you need a new case. Um, if it's beyond just gluing something back into place, it's usually because like the plastic has shattered and you just need a new case. Um, for the exterior, tears in like the uh, leather or naga hide kind of wrappings on the cases. Uh, you can just buy a tape that matches the color closely. It's really the best fix for it. Um, and we did put a note in here about how we like instruments in broken cases to be transported. Um, if possible, if it's because it's just not closing, if you can secure it with you know bungee cords or rope, that's the best thing, just something to prevent it from opening in transit. Uh, we don't recommend them as a permanent solution, although we have seen them as one. So, yeah, most case repair is really just replacing hardware, and it's just something that most people don't have. Uh, and we have suppliers that we can look up, you know, just about anything we need to buy for a case. Um, yeah, uh, on the back, there are 
some kind of just general things um, that I don't think we really need to go over. It's just uh, materials that we kind of like to have on hand for these kind of things. Um, but yeah, that's basically the presentation as we have it. Um, any anyone else have a question or comments? Yeah. Uh, regarding um, those like box with you, those like are emergency pads mm -hmm. and courts, are those like kits you can buy? They are kits you can buy. We buy them from one of our suppliers, but there are um, <coughs> sites that sell directly to directors. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've had a few directors <laughs> ask me about them, and that's usually what we'll tell them. Is, I don't know the ones that we've suggested, but I think we always put a suggestion with a caveat, you know, make sure you understand how to use the things in there. Yeah. In some of these cases, um, kits will have things that are unfamiliar to uh, yeah. you know, a young director or a beginning director, and so you would not want to overextend yourself, and then you are liable for doing something to either a school instrument or even worse, a, a student's instrument. So always, in, in those cases, defer not to do it and send it to the local store um, if you if you do choose to buy one of these cases or kits. Mm -hmm. so. Good question, though. Yeah. How do you feel about rechroming? Rechroming? Uh, if it's worth it, that's the question you have to ask yourself. It's very expensive, yeah. um, but if it's like an old model that you're never going to find a replacement slide for, that might be worth it to you. Um, if it's you know something like a box student line that I'm like, hey, I can replace that for you for eighty dollars, you might want to consider that instead. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 always a cost <laughs> estimate, and that's. We often, uh, as, as just as a general rule, we often get the question, is this worth it? And it's a tricky question beyond just like, is this instrument going to be worth more than this repair? Because I don't know what it's worth to you. Um, oftentimes, we'll get an instrument, and it's like $500 repair. And we'll, they're like, is it worth it? And I'm like, how important is it to you that your kid plays on this instrument? And often, I'll get a story about, well, this was my grandfather's instrument, and you know he had it in Europe during World War II, and I really want them to play on it. I'm like, is that worth $500 to you? You know, that's, that's the question. It's not whether the instrument's worth it. It's whether it's worth $500 for you to see your kid playing your grandfather's trumpet. Um, and that's, that's, like I said, that's not a question I can answer. Um, I can give you like, well, I could sell you an equivalent trumpet for the same price, you know? <laughs> But that's not exactly, that's not the only consideration. So. Is yeah. there any resource in For percussion? Yeah. <coughs> Send it in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Percussion that's, is. That's its own set. Yeah. 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 You get into percussion and there are so many different things. Yeah. <laughs> Interestingly enough. Most I think of, I'm already over time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, most of the percussion repair is, is fairly simple. In terms of you know you don't necessarily have certain set of tools for that you don't necessarily have you know a lot of fancy techniques there's not necessarily as much finesse to percussion repair it's a lot of parts and we keep a lot of parts in stock and then it's just a lot of intuitive knowledge of how things go together also um, understanding how different uh, different brands do different things yeah correct correct and so we can give guidance but a lot of times that stuff doesn't come out yeah. Yes. Are there any like niche instruments like auxiliary instruments that you would, you would say like don't bring in your shop, bring it to somebody that specializes in them? Um, not really. The only like we're happy to look at like just about anything. Um, I know like you guys have the Sousa archives, which is really cool. I love the Sousa archives, and I love talking to Nate Mandel about it all the time. But um, <laughs> we. Like, I've only done a couple of repairs for the Sousa archives, and that's because they're period instruments. So there are specialists in that field that have the materials that are period appropriate to it. And like, I've done an emergency repair for them because I happen to have lead solder, <laughs> which I don't like, but I do have it. <laughs> and yeah, so I managed to do a repair for him because he needed something soldered on to like an 1800s instrument. And it's like, yes, I have the appropriate solder for that. Um, but yeah, we're always happy to look at just about anything, really. <laughs> Somebody did make a comment earlier that there weren't any double reeds in here, right? I think I heard somebody say that. You want to just speak quickly to double reeds, either they're not in here, or, or your thoughts on just being careful with double reeds. I guess that's kind of niche 
when it comes to things we, we haven't or have talked about. Tonight. Yeah, I mean, it's it's essentially the same as the other woodwinds yeah. we've gone over. Uh, just because they're double reads doesn't mean they don't have tenons and keys and adjustments. Um, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Nathan, as we're winding down, can I take a couple of minutes? Yeah. You mind? Um, so again, I'm Jonathan. I'm the president of the store. Um, as we're talking about stuff today, we've gotten really specific. And Nathan, we thank you very much for your expertise and sharing a lot of this information today. Good job. Um, it, it also begs the bigger question in terms of what do you expect, right? Most of you are going to be out in the field teaching. You'll be directors, and you'll have your own programs and your own kids with their own issues and your own, you know, band rooms with their own issues. And and uh, many of you may be in our area, many of you may be in other areas. Um, it's a great thing to talk about in terms of big picture when you get out there in the field and you start working with a music store, what do you expect? So first of all, um, all of our technicians are a member of an association called NAPR, the National Association of Professional Band Instrument Repair Technicians. It's a mouthful. Just close. So it's N-A-P. B-I-R-T, Napert. They're actually based over in Normal, Illinois, but they are an international organization. Um, as interesting, it's, it's kind of interesting that one of the founding technicians that put Napert together was a former music shop technician. So we have a lot of, a lot of ties to that group. Um, but it is something to look for, is to look for that Napert logo. Keeping in mind that in order to be a member of NAPR, all you have to do is be a working technician who pays their dues. So NAPR does not actually authorize not technicians. There's not a certification you know, process for being involved. So you can see somebody showing the NAPR logo, which looks very official, but they may not necessarily be a trained technician. One of the things you want to ask when you're working with your store is where were your technicians trained? There are several schools across the country that do specific band instrument repair training courses. Um, Amy has actually been through one of those sessions through the Red Wing School up in, in Red Wing, Minnesota, which is very well respected. Nathan came through an apprenticeship program and learned on the job, which again is a very legitimate way to learn how to do repair. But you want to ask about how, your, how the technicians kind of learned their craft. How long have they been doing repair? Who else are they working with? What other schools do they serve? Talk to those directors. Hey, what's been your experience with their repair? Back to your question, somebody over here asked about, is there anything that, that you know, we wouldn't repair? We're very fortunate at the shop because we have technicians who are of a caliber that we see instruments of all levels, including professional level instruments where people trust us to do the repair on their very fine, fine level instruments. We also have two classically trained boutiers in stock uh, in, in our shops that do, um, you know, repair our orchestral string instruments. People have been formally trained to do orchestral string repair. That's also not particularly common. So as you're working with your stores, ask about their repair. Look into that. Tour the store. We'll see the shop. You know, we love to have people come back and come into the store and, and work with the technicians and see how we're doing things and get a feel for that. Sometimes it's dangerous. Don't take it personally if I say it's dangerous. <laughs> But, but there's a tremendous amount of training and investment that goes into doing band instrument repair properly. It's very inexpensive and easy to do band instrument repair poorly. Um, and we see a lot of that, frankly. Um, so it's important that as you're choosing the store that you're working with, choosing the store that you're recommending your students go to, choosing the store that you're gonna, that's going to be serving your community, that you look into the repair part of that. We look at that as foundational business for us. I mean, you know, from our standpoint, it's, it's a crucial part of who we are and what we do is the quality of the repair that we do. You can buy the instruments anywhere, but finding some place that can really serve those instruments on the back end in terms of keeping them working for you is crucial. The other thing to expect, too, is make sure that you've got technicians and a repair department and, frankly, a company that is prepared to do repair on your terms. So, you know, are they cost effective? Are they able to do billing with your school district? Do they have loaners available that you can use or your students can use? Are they capable of doing some of the repair that you will see? Can they fix broken tenons, or do they have to send those out? Can they do slide work on trombones, or are they sending that out? Can they do repad work, or are they sending that out? So making sure that they're able and capable to do the type of work that you're going to need, those are all great questions to ask. Um, from our standpoint, obviously, you're always welcome to come by and check us out. If you end up teaching in our area, we'd love to work with you. 
but it, there are stores like ours all over the country that have great technicians, um, really established repair shops. Just do a little due diligence. Generally speaking, you'll be able to get a feel for it pretty quickly, but we would encourage that. So what else did I leave out? How good we are, I guess. It's <laughs> <laughs> self-serving. Uh, no, that's good. And again, one of the things that we do, and you could expect from other stores too, is we do service contracts for school districts, which helps keep the budget in line, right? So for U of I, for example, we do work with, with the Marching Line Act where we have a flat fee service contract that we charge, and for that flat fee, we maintain those instruments throughout the course of the year. So the nice thing about that is that you don't necessarily have to worry about repair budgets because it flattens that out a little. So again, working with a larger store gives you the ability to work with people who can work within the parameters of your district and That's understand right. the type of work that you do. How do you determine what number is flat fee? So it's it's a pricing thing. So for us, what we do is is again, you know, there's an hourly rate that we charge typically for repair. Then there are certain repairs that are just flat fees. We kind of balance that, and then the idea is that that if nothing else, once a year you send the instruments in. So we're taking care of, you're taking care of them. We actually like that because if you think about it like either going to the dentist or taking your car in to get an oil change, if you're doing regular maintenance, it means the chances of things getting ugly is less because you're catching things early. So before things get out of control, we're seeing them and keeping on top of things. If an instrument is played for three years without being chemically cleaned, it's much harder to chemically clean at that third year than it is if we're doing it every year. If we're doing it every year, we can keep it cleaner, it'll go faster, it's less expensive to maintain, and we're getting ahead of any problems, rot, spot broken solders, things like that, we can keep on top of it faster. So that's why we would do that. Yes, sir? If you were to do that kind of thing where you're sending in instruments, would you, like, as technicians, would you guys prefer it if you were to send in, like, different groups of instruments so that you're getting, not necessarily, like, a constant stream of instruments, but, like, so that no, so that the school isn't sending all the instruments in at once. Sure, but that won't ever happen. In a perfect world, yes, we would be taking. You know, if you have three hundred instruments, we're taking one a day. You know, every day throughout the course of the year, kind of rotating the crew. But no, for our sometime come by the store in the summertime because we literally are stacked to the rafters because everybody sends their stuff in during the summer. So, so there's a seasonality to the repair thing. But we're prepared for that. You know, we know that that's how that works. We start bringing summer repairs in at the tail end of the season. In fact, Barry Hauser reached out to us this yep. week for the marching line. They're back from Ireland. First we're starting to send in instruments this week because we're going to get them in now so that you can get them through before the summer hits and have them back and ready. So again, that's something that you would work out with your store. But ultimately, they need to be prepared to work on your schedule. I mean, you know, as the director, your program is the priority, not our schedule. Yeah, if that makes sense. Um, how much am I allowed to ask? How much is the flat fee for you of I? Just out of curiosity. It depends on the instrument. Yeah, uh, instrument. yeah I don't oh, really. Top of my head, but but so it's, like so. Regardless, so it's this fee for all the flutes. This fee for all the clarinets. Correct. Right. Yeah. So yeah. if there's twenty clarinets, it's the same fee. Correct. Yeah, well, it's per clarinet. Yeah. Oh. So okay. like each clarinet is that fee times that whole clarinet fee. But you are correct in that we don't charge them. This serial number is the different fee than yeah. this other serial number. It's like every clarinet we charge a flat fee for, every flute we charge a flat fee for, but the flute fee is different than the clarinet fee. Just One thing I was going to say, a lot of teachers will ask us about this program that are new to us, and one of the ways I, I sell it is, as I say, this is a consistent number that you can rely on every year, and when you're talking to administrators who are all about the money and the hard lines, and they're like, what's a consistent number you can give us? You can provide this document saying the music shop or this company provides this service, and every year you'll know this amount of money will come out, will be allocated for the repair line, because you're going to have music lines, you're going to have general budget lines, and you know maybe under 500 and over 500 line. And so I love that part of the discussion when we're talking about yeah. service contracts, because they're like, oh, really? It's just one flat fee, or it's that fee? You know, Oh, you're honest about... Um, up, your prices might increase, and so yeah, we tell you you know once in advance, saying hey, by the way, the silver might increase. So it's just wonderful to be able to say, I understand money, administrator, and, and I want to protect our school with money. Now, you know, a good example of kind of how that's a benefit is 
if you're working with a large enough store that can handle something like that, we had a situation recently with my sousaphone that was yeah. a trip to the top. Oh. Slid oh. Kind of <laughs> wearing it down the, down the ramp. I'm and sure it wasn't funny through. at the time, but one of our employees showed us the video because he yeah. was with the band at the time. <laughs> but, but basically what happens is that repair was covered underneath the service contract because it was accidental damage, which is part of what the service contract covers. So even though that repair was far outside of the scope of what we would normally expect in a given year for U of I, we can assimilate that because of the size of shop that we are. And so basically it's just kind of a, we assume that there's a certain amount of repair work we're gonna do and sometimes you'll see something outside of that that we just kind of, it just slides into that field. And that's the benefit to a school is when something like that happens, you're not all of a sudden scrambling to come up with an extra five or six hundred dollars to fix this, fix this horn that, that you weren't expecting. The other thing that's nice about that is that it allows us to keep an eye on your inventory so that we can give you a heads up and say, hey, we're getting close to the end of this lifespan. You know, this berry is starting to get to its last legs probably in the next year or two. In fact, the new piccolos, if anybody's been watching the U of I posts, they just got all their new piccolos, which we helped them get, and that's because this fall we had issues with the piccolos, and we told Barry, look, piccolos are really at the end of their lifespan. And so he was like, okay, great, but we'll replace the piccolos. So we helped them get those three down. So it's, you know, again, that process works for you in a lot of different ways. So. What were typical like, gross estimates when you would cost for like, a small high school program? Call us, right. just because it, that can be all over the map. I mean, we're happy. We're not hiding behind anything. It's just there's so many variables that go into that. It's it's hard for us to just kind of pull that out. Of so cool. All right, we have talked enough. Any other questions for us tonight? Thank you. Thank you. We are available anytime to talk to you, either as this group or individually. Feel free to call us or stop by. Nathan, Amy, Christopher, and Curtis are all based out of the store here out on Market View. Except between the South and West. But really, you, you know, come by or give us a call. We're happy to talk about it. And then Curtis is leaving some of his cards. Yeah, so there's there's some of our cards. So if you want to follow up to get that front horn thing, or if you have questions that are deeper, or if you want to make an on-site visit, you know, we're going to let you do it. Then here's a few more of these packets. Feel free to pass them out to your friends or MBA students or NAMFB. What are they called? Now? Nappy. There you go, Nappy. Yeah. So, but thank you all. You guys have been fantastic today. So, thank you all. I was just going to ask because I read through my emails. I think we printed it out and then delivered it in the case.